Welcome guys to the eighth episode of Creating Magic. Today we have a very special individual that usually actually needs no introduction because you all know who he is, I know who he is. The one, the only, the legend, John Kerry. Thank you, John. Hello, Viz. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to you guys watching this. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me along today, Biz. Uh, we, finally, uh, we finally arranged our schedules and we, we're going to do it today. Yes, it has happened. Me and John have never actually had a proper conversation like this. So I am uh, very excited, just like a little kid, getting to hang with John for a little bit here. I've actually prepared um, a couple of more serious questions. So for everybody out there that likes to get more insight in uh, magic, magic world, and creating magic, stick around until the end. And also, John is actually going to teach an unreleased trick of his so do stick around for that and if you don't want to stick around you can just jump at the timestamp that you have it over there but i'm very excited to talk with john about these things and the first thing that i want to attack is regarding books john has written eight physical books and more ebooks than uh, I've, I've i've gotten to actually count and i wanted to ask you john what's the proper way to explain a magic trick in writing Wow, good question. I was chatting with Cameron Francis on a Zoom the other night and he said he had a lot of fun with you and you asked great questions. First question, a great question. Uh, by the way, it's nine physical books now. The new book, John Kerry nine. and Friends, came out in right. June. Sorry, but just to let the guys know. True, um, true, true. Yeah, well, my books are not written for the complete beginner. However, my material, uh, my material is user, very user-friendly for the majority of magicians. Uh, because usually uh, my stuff relies, there are some slides, but usually they're not too technical. Uh, a lot of my routines involve streamlining effects, stripping out difficult moments and, and replacing them with subtlety and good construction. Yeah. So True. with that said, with that said, when I write a book, I almost think like I'm having a conversation like I am with you, with my reader almost like we're sitting in a, in a nice coffee bar uh, in New York or in London or in Bucharest, your, your capital of your home uh, country. Uh, and then I'm just talking about the effect with them, you know, you know, so you need a deck, you need, uh, you need an envelope. Okay. So, you know, the pack is shuffled. Yeah. And then you go into the procedure. Um, I've been told that uh, I have the English word is a very succinct style of writing. Succinct yeah. means there's yeah. um, a way of getting to the point without going on and on and on, you know? Yeah, very good. Without, without too much padding, I think the word is, you know? Uh, give the reader all the information he or she needs. Give them some notes at the end if there are some additional ideas so that they can sit there with the cards, with the coins, or with the business cards if it's a mentalism item, because I like close-up mentalism as well. And we can talk about that later. Um, give them all the information they need, but don't don't go on and on and on with unnecessary, you know. Okay. Um, it should be simple and to the point, you know. And uh, I think the majority of my effects over the years uh, are usually no more than three pages, sometimes one page, one and a half pages, two pages. Very rarely do I write a, a, a piece of magic up and it's five, six pages, almost never. But has this um, always been your style from the first book that you've written? No. No. No, most definitely not. When I got my first desktop computer, you know, the old tower computers, you know, the big yeah. old clunky things, maybe, uh, ooh, how long? 15 years ago, something like that. I started to write some ideas on making files on Microsoft Word. And, oh, my God, it was so intensive it was i used to write too much nonsense too much bs you know and repeat certain things and it was like i had a backpack on my back and i was walking through the sahara in 120 degree heat i wasn't getting to the point i wasn't getting to the point quick enough you know it was it was it was the complete opposite of uh, of how i answered the, your question just now but over time, I learned to to strip down the writing, to streamline the writing, like I like to streamline 
my magic when I create magic and, and perform. And I improved. The more you do it, the more you improve. True. So some of my uh, some of my earlier ebooks were uh, the writing wasn't the best, but it was my starting point, you know, to put out these ebooks in the community, the magic community. And gradually I improved. Gradually I improved, and uh, but I always make sure I give all the details that the reader needs without going on and on. And also for me, the crediting is very very important. If I can give credit, if 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 I know the credits, citations, the resources, I will credit them. Because let's face it, how long does it take to say, uh, you know, Elias Biz or John Kerry? It's a name, but it's respect for the creator or the person who inspired you. True. You know. Yeah, true. And that's very important to me. And I do that in my on my downloads, my video downloads, um, my Zooms. I do a monthly Zoom masterclass. Some people might know about. Uh, directly through me. We had Cameron Francis on Friday night. We had such a great time. And Cameron says hi, by the way, Biz. And uh, he's coming to the UK next year to do filming with Owen, you know? I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. Excited. So I'm going to try and I'm going to try and come along next year. I'll ask Owen. And um, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, it does. It, it, it does. The next thing yeah. would be what gets trimmed out of your books? What doesn't make it? Uh, yeah, because as uh, as much as that makes it, there's a lot of stuff that that goes, you know, discard, you know. I can imagine. Um, it's when I realise that the effect is uh, the effect is not finished. It needs more work. It needs more thinking, and uh, it doesn't really offer anything that I think would be worthy of my reader's attention. It's an effect which maybe has potential. But it still needs more work. Excuse me, I got the heat. Yeah. Drinking, my, drinking my coffee quickly earlier. Um, it's something that I'm not 100% happy with, and this is very important to you guys at home. You know, uh, don't always think an effect, even if you're not a creator, a performance effect that you perform, either socially for friends with coffees or at meals. You are a semi-professional or a full-time professional. I don't care if you've been performing an effect for 20 years. You may think you have every presentation every point of that routine down but if you can elevate that effect five percent or even or even two percent this has to be good yes yeah it has to be good but it also implies that you have to be open to evolving it because if you're not you have to be open and i have i have a network of some very talented creative friends around the world and i get i tell them to be brutally honest to be very honest when i when I submit some ideas to them, you know, ahead of maybe adding them to a book project or a download project. And I, and, and they are very straight, straight up with me. You know, they, they will tell me if something's very good and very nice, but they will also offer suggestions where they say, I don't like this part. I think it could be, I think, I think it could be cleaner or have you thought about doing it like this? And this is like the sessioning and the jamming, the sessioning and the jamming and, uh, you know, and, and we're lucky, Biz, even before the COVID era where we all were locked in at home lockdowns. I've been lucky like you to have online correspondence with some amazing people over the years. You know, people like John Bannon, Jack Carpenter and John Guastafero, Cameron, Liam, Liam Montier and so on. You know, and, the, and, and my hero and yours, Danny Duortes in Spain. I love the Spanish magic scene. Uh, if you so, want to talk about the Spanish magic scene, I have some experience in, in lecturing over there. We can talk about that and the people and, and the atmosphere that Danny and Tamariz have created. An amazing place. Um, regarding this idea that you have people that um, give you their brutal opinion, right? I've noticed yeah. that there are, there are individuals that pick up magic and they lack a sense of knowing when a trick is good, knowing when a trick is original. And there are people like you, and there are people, there are more, more creatives and performers that have this sense to be able to tell if something they've created or if something they've learned or performed isn't as good as it can be. So the question is, how, what would be your advice for somebody that wants to have that sense, but just looks at anything they do and they're like, yeah, I think it looks good, but I don't know what can be better. 
So what would be your advice for being able to see? Uh, well, they need to road test that trick, that effect, uh, not on magicians. They need to road test that effect on lay people yeah. because magic is a performing art. Whether you are a, a hobbyist who likes to practice routines and moves, a semi-professional who does a day job and does a few bookings or a full-time pro. You need to road test that on people. And don't do it on family or, or close friends. Do it on people socially, you know, maybe in the pub or uh, in the bars. That's where I learned to perform. When I, I don't live in London anymore. I left many years ago but for the countryside. But um, my, uh, my sort of testing ground for performing was the pubs and the bars in London. Uh, big city, many pubs, many bars. And, and, and you get a sense of... People are very, English people anyway, in pubs are very honest and very brutal. If they like something, they will respond. But if they see something or they think they see something, they will be honest and tell you. And that's good. But when you are a young man, when I was a young guy, I used to feel kind of deflated when I got home thinking, ah, sh man, I thought that was good, you know, but they, yeah, you know, they caught me on this or they, they, they looked suspicious. And you've got to take this on board, you know. Uh, yeah. You've got to take this on board. Um, you know, it's important to have studied as well. You know, books are my thing. I come from an era of books. We're now in the digital media uh, era, rather digital media era, if you like, Biz, yep. and um, which gives great resources uh, to magicians around the world. Unfortunately, uh, there's been an information uh, overload, I think, uh, in the magic world, and this can sometimes swallow people up with too information, too much information. The point I was going to make is uh, people are trying to work and create uh, ideas. You know, if they've done their study and their due diligence, nobody can own all of the books. Nobody can own all of the downloads. However, uh, there are there are people, knowledgeable people out there around the world where they can they can uh, submit an idea to somebody and say, what do you think of this? Um, is there any credits I've missed out and so on and so forth, you know? Or maybe they know those credits because of their their study, you know. True, true. Very important to reach out. I hope and that answers your question. I went I went around with different things there, but you know, didn't feel like it. Everything contributed, and uh, no, you also you. opened up one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that. Do you believe there are two questions at the same time, and you put them together? So there's a lot of tutorials and a lot of um, reveals happening right now on YouTube. And so yes. that's, that's one aspect that I want you to keep in mind while I'm going to ask you a lot of the people that learn magic, they do it on YouTube. That's the first place they go to. And they learn magic from people. Most of the time they learn magic from people that are not hmm, good. <laughs> Let's just put it like that. You know, they're yeah. hobbyists and they might teach a technique the way that they think it's done or you know maybe not the proper way and uh, meanwhile the magic community is is not on youtube i remember when i talked with alex pandrea he started putting a couple of tutorials on youtube and he told me that he had such a backlash from the magic community that somebody of his caliber was revealing uh, was putting out not revealing was putting out free tutorials for people on youtube and the thing that I'm asking you is, we are in a different age right now. It's a digital age and everybody's learning digital. Whereas a, lot, a big chunk of the magic community is, um, is hidden away because this is how our roots are. We, we are in secrecy. You know, everything is in books, everything is in, uh, on magic websites. People don't even know there are magic websites, you know. So... The thing is, how can we make it so laymen and normal people learn from the right people magic and are inspired by people like you, people like Bannon, people that are really in the meat of magic and they know how to present magic and inspire somebody instead of them ending up on YouTube and learning one, two tricks and going away. So what right do you think question. is the solution here? Well, I can give you first-hand experience of that when in one or two of the bars and pubs uh, in this little, little place I live in, in Hertfordshire, England, uh, where uh, people have actually asked me, um, 
over the last 15, 16 years since I since I had moved here from London. Um, would it be possible for you to teach me a trick? And, and I, I always say, yeah, sure, no problem. Either that day or we arrange to meet for a beer. I don't charge them, even though I, I have private students, but we can talk about that later. Um, I don't charge them anything. We have a beer. They buy a beer. I buy a beer for them. You know, you know we buy around each, you know. Um, because as Danny Dortis always says, no effect is self-working because you have to create the atmosphere. You have, uh, you have to have a good presentation, you know, uh, because every effect we know, you know, as an experienced magician, every effect must have a presentation. If an effect doesn't have a presentation, it's a procedure. A procedure is yeah. not an effect or a presentation. Um, you know, it's like if, like, yeah. you know, some people say, well, how can I present pro uh, producing four aces? Well, you can talk about how, you know, I, I used to play cards professionally. And uh, and one day the pit boss at the casino said, you're not coming in anymore. You're winning far too often. We don't know what you're doing, but we know you're doing something. And in fact, this goes even further away from the casinos where people who know me and my work with cards in the gambling world, in the magic world, always say to me, I won't play cards with you. And I say, would you like to would you like uh, would you like to show me to show you something? Uh, something why these guys think like this about me. And then I do spectator cuts the aces. I produce the four aces. You know, I do a triumph and end up with the aces face up in the middle. All I've done there is created a, an emotional hook yeah. to get into the effect. You know? you know, an emotional hook to get into the effect. It's like the ambitious card. Very nice. Um, my friend Andrew Girard, a wonderful creator and a dear friend from Vancouver, Canada. Andrew's got an effect. Basically, this is not the effect I'm going to uh, teach uh, later. Uh, but just as an example, you've got the ambitious card. Everybody loves the ambitious card. Uh, but there's a problem with the ambitious card. If you're doing four or five phases, sure. you do phase one. Phase two must build upon phase one. Phase three must build upon phase three. Phase four must build. And then five, the climax. Yeah which brings the effect full circle. But I see a lot of ambitious card routines which start out, it goes in, boop, it's on top. It goes in the middle again, boop, it's on top. And again, boop, it's on top. It may be different methods, you know, the death illusion, tilt, a shift, a pass, or some bluff move or something like that. But the effect is not building. It's maybe plateauing, as we say in English. Sure. It's just going in a straight line. It's not building. And sometimes even worse is the effect starts to dip. You know, yeah, because it's re repetitive. Well, that's why. Yeah, exactly. Um, which is another reason I've had friendly arguments and discussions with magicians over the years, which is why I don't like to uh, finish the ambitious card with the card from the wallet. I think the card from the wallet is a classic effect that stands on its own. It does. But that's just my opinion. That's my opinion. You know, um, it's like people do. I've seen people do the ambitious card four or five phases. You know, maybe do the uh, the pop up card at the end. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. everything. People relax. They they palm the card, and uh, they hand the deck out, and then and then they load the wallet, and all of a sudden there's a wallet. They open the zipper, <laughs> and there's the card. True. Yes, yes, people. Yes, people will react to that, but I think I think the uh, I think the uh, Ross Bertram. Ooh, uh, I think the ambitious card. I think the ambitious card uh, stands on its own. So getting back to Andrew's thing, and I'm sure he won't mind me sharing this. Um, just a one phase ambitious card, you say, and I would say, Biz, you know, life is full of ups and downs. You know, you have the good days and the bad days. You know, the good days, everything's great. You feel very positive. You have a smile on your face. Uh, you're productive with your work. You look forward to socializing people and going out. But life can deal us some bad cards sometimes some things where we, we end up in a very dark place, sometimes worse than other, other, other people and other times. And everything seems like an effort, you know, and, and your mood and your spirit goes down, you know, and, and you can't seem to lift yourself upwards out of this, out of this mood, this depression, you know. And um, so we'll, we'll just try something with this deck to demonstrate, hopefully, what positive energy and positive thinking can do. I just spread the face up deck. You say stop, please. Stop. Okay, you stopped on the, uh, the the Queen of Diamonds, yeah? Yep. The Queen of Diamonds, yeah? But you could have stopped on uh, any one of these cards, yeah? Any one cool. of these cards, yeah? Okay. 
I'm not going to shuffle the cards. I'm not going to cut the cards. But your card is roughly, if I was to estimate, about uh, maybe uh, 28 or 29 from the top. Just imagine that card is the, the card that's dragging you down, that's causing your spirit to sink, that's causing you not to be positive, where you don't want to go out the house, you don't want to do anything. But then all of a sudden, you speak to a member of your family or a close friend, somebody you love, somebody you trust, and they say, hey, Biz, you've got to lift yourself up out of this uh, negative energy. You've got so much going for you, you know, be positive, man. You know, think upwardly, think positive thoughts, you know, because the only way if you've got positive thoughts and you channel them correctly is up, up, yeah. up, up, yeah. up. And if you do that, my friend, anything is possible. Beautiful. There we there go. go. So that's a one phase ambitious card. The presentation I've changed from Andrew's, but uh, the inspiration came from Andrew. And that's talking about positive energy, you know, and it's one little. Uh, I think the beautiful thing about this is that it's using uh, the card trick as a tool for what you're saying instead of the other way around, where the main attraction is the card trick itself. Yes, which is beautiful. Most definitely beautiful. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, thank you. I mean. I think that was a three minute piece with the full presentation, was, you know, um, in that time you could do, you could do six classic passes and three tilts, you know? <laughs> so here's a, I'm happy that you, you put out uh, this idea with slides. There's i uh, I'm a slide of hand guy. And there, here's the thing, whenever I go at conventions and I talk with, uh, it hasn't happened to me. I don't know, maybe, Maybe people are nicer or I don't know. But um, these creators of sleight of hand have told me that they feel that whenever they jam with uh, magicians that perform card tricks, they look down upon slides. Because they say slides are unnecessary or why learn, why learn uh, five forces when I just need two? Why learn uh, 15 controls when I just need... Uh, uh, two or three. So tell yes. me, what is your take on this feud between s move monkeys and uh, people that don't are not as attracted to sleight of hand? Great question, and uh, I'm glad you uh, brought this uh, topic up because uh, I have some I have some definitive views on it. Um, let's take uh, let's take a basic car control that so many magicians use i don't like uh but they seem to use it maybe because like the elmsley count they think oh it's easy and it gets the job done yeah yeah, yeah? But we're talking about the double undercut yeah the double <laughs> undercut. <laughs> yeah the yeah. double undercut you know uh i just do it for the camera someone stops at the cards and they immediately cut like this there's no pause there's no delay and they think they are getting away with it now, maybe they will with some people, but if you do that on 50 people as a, like a survey, you will get called on it by people. If, if you're going to do the double undercut, Queen of Clubs, come back, get your break, drop your hand so that the break is hidden and pause. And so you will remember your card, yes? And then come back and then, you know, undercut half below the break, and then maybe drop to the table. That's a lot fairer looking, you know, if you're going to do the double undercut. Oh, the double undercut, it's like the riffle force, another pet peeve of mine, the riffle force. You're going to force the queen of clubs, Biz, yeah? So they make a swing cut, they get their break, and they immediately riffle force to the break. There's no subtlety to it, you know? There's no subtlety. I mean, if you're going to riffle force the king of diamonds, for example, make a swing cut and table the deck and say, okay, we're going to have some fun here, guys. What I've done is I've put a step into the deck. So I can retain my break, regain my break and then do a maybe a dribble force, which I prefer. And by the way, guys, to get a step is very simple. I hope this doesn't mind me explaining this here. You get your pinky break and I push over like that. I'm exaggerating that now to get a step there. Whoops, excuse me. And then I put the deck down and I can talk because this frees up my hands to communicate. Come over here. We'll have some fun. What's your name? Mary. Come over here, Mary. We'll have some fun. I pick up the deck. I pull down on the step. And now I'm ready for my force, you know. 
Um, move monkeys. Um, I'm a move monkey. Even though I'm known for publishing semi-automatic effects predominantly, as well as some with sleight of hand, I love, I love working on moves. I think um, in my private notes, uh, we're talking false cuts now. I think I have about 11 or 12 original ones, original as far as I know. But uh, with all the classical false cuts and ones I've learned out there in, uh, in person with other creators or via downloads that I've purchased from Big Blind Media, Penguin, Peter Adalakazam, oh. Andy and Josh of Vanishing Inc. And, and my books in my library, I think I've got something like over 50 false cuts that uh, I know and do and love. And this is lovely some nights if I don't really want to work on, you know, I've done maybe two or three hours on the computer on a book project that day or or done some other things, either in magic or away from magic. Um, you know, sometimes I'll just sit there and, you know, I'll just practice false cuts. You know, there's a Frank Thompson cut. You know, there's a Bobby Bernard cut. You know, there's a Jay Ozy cut, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth, you know. But I won't do it in any order. I'll do it as a drill, but I don't know which false cut is coming next. You know, then I then I might do then I might do one of these flourish uh, these flourish style full cuts. You know, one of these things. You know, Johnny does <laughs> pottery, baby. Yeah, baby. But no, you know, and, uh, and so uh, and um, and so on. Uh, you know, I see I see Ben recently. Ben will do this one, which I really like. Beautiful. You know, that's really nice. You know, and, and yeah, and 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 and. Um, and so nice, you know, and uh, my friend Tom Rose in Germany, uh, he does some beautiful false cuts, you know, Tom Rose, Tom Rosenkrantz, but uh, uh, his music career has taken over now, but Tom's got some great, yeah, so false cuts, um, forces, I'm addicted to forces, the more tools you've got, you can plug those into different routines, because, for example, a force that a lot of magicians, I, I think, think is, is not worth doing is is the classical cross cut force yeah, yeah. of Max Holden the cross cut force. I have thoughts on that. You know, a cross cut force can be great provided you have the shift of focus and and the time misdirection built into the routine. You know, uh, I'm just looking for a prop here. No. Um, we'll just use a card box. Okay, so there it is. <laughs> Excuse me. You maybe do uh, a shuffle, retaining it on top. And you say, uh, please, please, reach over and cut up about half the deck. That's great. Just put them on top at a weird angle, yeah? Okay. And I've got a card box here as well, yeah? Card box. And this is going to act like a like a locked box. We haven't got a key. And uh, we'll just uh, place that card right there in the box. So I force the six of spades. One thing I haven't done is what you see a lot of people doing. Oh, would you cut the pack in half, please? Okay, we'll take this packet and you, the magician, that they do it, the magician does it, and we'll mark the cut and they make a specific action like this, <laughs> like they're making a red cross, yeah? And then, and then they say, okay, look at the card you cut to. You might yeah. get called on that. People might know, you know, so you have to shift the focus. You know, the line about a funny angle is the Ben Earl line, uh, which is great. Put the other one on top at a weird angle. You know, they might do this, they might do that. You know, they might do this. That's fine. Now you need shift of focus. And usually when I'm working with a cross cut force, I say, I'm going to ask you two questions. Do you have a good memory or a bad memory? Good, bad is otherwise. Actually, one question, actually. I say, it's OK. You only have to lock that card into your mind. I do not say, remember the card you cut to. Very fine. You know, uh, and so on. Getting back to my point. Getting back to my point. The more tools you have, the more moves you have the more you can utilize those tools in your library, in your working set, your repertoire, to plug into certain effects. Because there are, with card control bids, as you, as you know, there are, you know, there are two types of control. What I like to, I think Roberto Jobby uh, coined this term, there are active controls and passive controls. And active control might be they say stop, blah, blah, blah. They look at a card, say the Jack of Diamonds. You know, that card goes back in the yeah. pack and then you, and then you shuffle, yeah? The Mahatma control to get the card to the top, yeah? However, there might be something called, um, that's an active control because you're actively mixing the cards. Same again, Jack of Diamonds. And I say, Biz, uh, I mean, you could have had any one of these cards, yeah? I'm not going to shuffle the cards. I'm not going to cut. I'm not going to do anything. And this, the classical Tommy Tucker pass, which I love. True. It looks like nothing has happened. So there's certain effects where a control, where shuffling is important, is good. There are certain routines, though, where, where a, um, a passive control, 
like the Tommy Tucker pass or or maybe something like this, the uh, old Frank Thompson pass, King of Hearts, goes back. I say, look, would you put the King of Hearts back in the back, please? And I say, roughly how far down would you say that card is approximately? About Whoa. halfway in? Okay. Oh. And you've done nothing, apparently. Oh. I've never <laughs> seen that. Before, yeah? Something like that, yeah. That's Frank Thompson's. That's Frank Thompson's bluff pass. It was published in one of the two John Rackabama books years ago, Card Finesse, either number wow. one or volume two. Beautiful. Yeah. You guys want to learn it? Very simple. I riffle down. They say stop. They look at the card, say the nine of hearts. And what you do is you go that and they put the card back and your right pointer or index finger extends. And by doing that, it automatically puts the right sure. packet underneath that corner. As you look at them and you say, about halfway down and then as you raise your hands yeah. this packet comes in i take my left hand away the two packets side jogged i come down like this and pause and then square up you can yeah. only do it on the same people once sure. but why would you repeat it it's a great bluff <laughs> it's a great bluff yeah so the more tools you've got is you love that yeah good man um present for you mr biz um I give you my PayPal later. You can send me one hundred dollars. Uh, no, I'm joking. Um, the more tools you've got, you know, you can plug certain certain controls, certain forces fit certain routines better than others, you know. And um, because I don't want people saying, "Oh, John, you've got fast hands with my magic." I don't want that. Some magicians who do gambling type stuff might want that. I personally don't want. I don't want them to say, "Oh, you've got quick hands." Or I wouldn't want to play cards with you, the classical line from a layman. I want to think there's nothing that's happened, you know. There's nothing. And yet it happens, you know, it happens. Um, and that's where presentation comes in, Biz. You can you can throw loads of smoke and mirrors around an effect and you can alter the timeline of an effect like Tamariz and Danny Duarte's and the Spanish magic school do, you know, and you know, you, you can you can erase memories from what happened earlier or you can change the timeline to when they chose a card, when they shuffled and when they cut. And that's what makes the real magic, you know, uh, reframing, wow. you know, reframing. reframing. Yeah. Uh, you segue into, into another question and I'll just ask you two at the same time. Like, what is your definition of magic and why do you love magic? Let me answer the second question first. I love magic because there's always something new to discover. It gives me great joy and satisfaction. Um, it's given me great joy and satisfaction and solace during some difficult times in my life. I lost my mother and father at this house uh, in the last eight years. And um, there was very dark periods where at night I was like, firstly, when dad was ill before he passed away. And then after that, mum a few years later, where at night when I made sure they were resting and they, they had their medication and they had their food I cooked for them. Um, I used to sit in my room and my cards and my magic used to be an escape uh, mechanism for me, you know, to, to just get the cards and, and work on material, you yeah. know, maybe put my headphones on and listen to my Spotify on my phone, you know, and but I'd always have the cards there, you know, and, you know, just give me, but also it's enabled me to travel the world, you know, yeah. uh, as I said to Craig Petty on the YouTube interview a few years ago, um, about nearly ten, nine or ten years ago, for 24 years I worked on the, on the railways, the railroads as our American friends call it, in the UK in a ticket office selling train tickets and giving information. But that job was killing me, getting up at 3:45, 4 a.m. every morning, getting the train, getting oh, the train, getting the train into London to start work at 5:30 a.m getting home quite early in the afternoon, maybe 2, 2.30, but being absolutely physically and mentally exhausted, yeah, you know? And then everything changed, you know? Um, I had the offer. My first book was published by Magic Scene, who put the magazine out in the UK, Mark Leverage and his, and his colleagues. And they said, do you want to publish a book? We'd love to do one for you, Crafted with Carey. And that book opened up doors. Uh, lecture inquiries were coming in from not just the UK, but across the world, and especially Europe. And then the opportunity to do a tour in Germany, Austria and Switzerland came up uh, via my dear friend Alexander de Kova. And he, uh, oh, oh, oh. He, he took it over from another guy, you know, and uh, he said, I need an answer soon though, John, because at this moment I still had a job, that railway job that I hated. But I got the blessing from my dear mum and dad. I said, look, I could have just done it and said, right, you know, how, how young the railway you? job. 
How young were you? Uh, well, I'm 55. I'm 55 now, so that would have been when I was about 45, you know? Okay. Yeah. And um, I said, please give me your blessing. Give me 12 months with my magic. I've got a one-month lecture tour through Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, 15, 16 bookings, plus two workshops. Wow. Um, wow, wow, wow. Let me do this. I said, Alex and his wife, Elena, at the time, uh, said they would take me around and look after me. And mum said, I said, I promised mum. I said to mum, because dad was quite ill, I said to mum, I promise you, if if everything gets shitty and the magic doesn't work out, give me 12 months, one year. If it doesn't work out, I'll, I'll go back and get another job, but not on the same job, a different job yeah. in the street, you know, in an office or in a in a in a bar or whatever, you know. But thankfully, thank God, it 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 opened up doors, and uh, that tour was a big success, and um, the money I was able to make on that tour helped helped to give me some savings because I didn't have much savings at all. I took a chance, you know, and yeah. um, and then I, the next year, the next year I started to publish my own books. Minimalistica and then other books, you know, Carrie's Way, um, Me, My Cards and I, and so on and so forth. Myriad, Reflections, Very Best of John Carrie and the latest one, John Carrie and Friends. Um, and I've since been able to travel. I spent a month in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, I've done two further European tours. Uh, I did a tour of the East Coast of America. Got to hang out with some of the magic gods there. Went to Madison Square Garden, watched the concert. Just for the love of a pack of cards and, and, and no, magic. Amazing. And, but most importantly, as most importantly, though, this, sorry, most importantly, uh, as Danny Dorsey always says, Danny always says, the real magic is the friends, the friendships. You can't put a price on them. No. You can't think how many dollars or how many euros or how many pounds on friendship, real friendships, you know. And I get to travel the world and do something I love. And I don't have to get up crazy early in the morning like I used to, yeah. except when I have to go to Europe for uh, some some work, maybe some bookings, or to see my students, you know. But yeah, sorry, lots of talking there. Uh, so this was the first. Uh, this was the second question. Uh, why do you love magic? Which yeah, I love. I'm, I'm thank you for the long answer because it really shows. And the creating as well, like you, sir, and the creating. That's why I love it. <laughs> yeah, you know, of course. I have two magic words. People say, what is my creative process? I have two magic words. What if, what if, question mark. They're my magic words. What if, you know, and then I think, you know, what if, blah, blah, blah. And the late great Tommy Wonder used to have a concept he called the dream. He said, dream what the effect would be like if it was real magic. Now try to create a method or methods that come as close to that dream That's possible. effect as you possibly can yeah it can be a long process sometimes but it can be very rewarding as well you know um and how do i define magic yep that's the second question oh god that's a that's a tough one uh, how do i define magic magic for me uh is creating a sense of wonder with the lay public uh, the public you know and making them laugh putting a smile on their face showing them something cool that they may have never seen before because a lot of the public have never seen real close-up magic. They've maybe seen some stuff on AGT and YouTube and blah, blah, blah. But to see actual real close-up magic, you know, right under their eyes, you know, in a bar or a restaurant, you know, create that sense of wonder. And it enables people to switch off from the day-to-day -day boring stuff. Maybe they're under pressure with their family life, financially paying their bills. Magic enables me to, you know put a smile on people's faces and maybe just for a few minutes, share a few minutes of my time with them and, and do something hopefully they will remember, you know? I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's the best I can do at the moment. That is uh, regarding uh, the spectators. Yeah. What about the art form itself? When is it yeah, big, um, magical? What's the last question? What is ma magical? When is a card trick? magic it stops being a trick yeah it becomes when there when when there is no when there is nowhere for people to go where there is no method to see for the spectators to see no method for them to think of no suspicion for them to be thinking about where it looks so fair you know you know i mean like the pass i talked about earlier the tommy tucker pass you know which i was taught many years ago you know 
say, uh, so your card goes back in the pack, yeah, and it's about, what, halfway down, yeah? I'm not going to shuffle the cards. I'm not going to cut. Put your hand on top of the pack. Yeah. Imagine this pack is 52 stairs. And imagine your card, card climbing like you, one step at a time, all the way up. Turn over the top card. Boom, there it is. However, if you did it like this, put your card back, please. Look, I do this. I do this. Put your hand on top of the back. It's nowhere near as good. I don't care what people say. No, you know? not at all. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, it looks like nothing happens, you know, um, you know, it's like, it's like a simple vanish of a coin, Chinese coin, yeah? yeah, like a simple vanish of a coin. If you do this, well, people with any intelligence are going to know. It's <laughs> yeah? True. Yeah? yeah, it's true. It's true. But I've got a pen here. Yeah. So I've got two things. I've got a pen. This is my magic pen. And I've got a coin. So in my hand, I've got a coin. And on the table, I've got a pen, yeah? yeah? Watch. I push the pen through my hand. It's gone. Hold on. So different. And you've got a nice effect. Credit to David Williamson for the out of the cap, you know? Yeah. So you know for something like that, instead of, you know, John Ramsey, the great Scottish magician, used to talk about magic. He said, if you want somebody to look at something, look at it yourself. If you want somebody to look at you, look at them. It seems very simplistic, but it's true. You know, I've got a coin here, a Chinese coin. It's a nice coin, huh? But watch, if I go like this, that's making it look like magic rather than doing that. Yeah. You see the difference? It's so different. You know, I've got a Chinese, a Chinese coin here. You like it, Biz, yeah? I do. It's a nice coin, yeah? Watch very carefully. And that's magic, you know? So different. I do want to talk a little bit about the, 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 so it ties in with the fact that you, your first convention was in 1986. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, the the, yes. The IBM, the IBM British Ring yeah. convention in Eastbourne on the coast in the UK. So you've, uh, you've been at more conventions since then and you, Many. you have seen the magic community change, evolve, go in one way or another. One thing that I have noticed, yeah. and I've noticed ever since I got into magic and uh, I went at my first convention, is that nowadays there's a very big uh, rupture between um, magicians of different ages. So whenever you're at a convention, you'll see kids only with kids. You'll see uh, youngsters only with youngsters. And then you'll see uh, all of the 30, 40 plus, they're together there. And I've talked with uh, Steve Rowe, I've talked with Cameron, I've talked with other magicians that have been in magic for far longer than that, and David Solomon, and it didn't used to be like this. I mean, when you see, if I see you and I'm interested in magic, and I see a kid that's 24, who will I learn more from? <laughs> you know, like, if I think about it, obviously you, but why is it that youngsters and older magicians do not mix as much nowadays as they did back in the past before the internet i'm not sure i'm really not sure one thing i one thing i always try to do at my lectures you know physical lectures in-person lectures and a case in point being a few weeks ago i was in leeds a city in the north of england did a lecture and it was a great turnout nearly 40 people which for a british club is a good attendance mm -hmm. and um, 36 37 people and there were quite a lot of, there was a good age demographic there there were there were children as young as 11 and 12 two or three kids a girl and two boys there was uh, teenage guys there was guys in their maybe late 20s 30s guys 50s like me and older pensioners you know people 60 70 retired people yeah. um so it was a good mix you know and but I, um, I made sure I got the, the kids up for a couple of the tricks, you know, for the performance and the explanation, you know, Very nice. and to encourage them, you know, and, uh, and I have a little digital bundle I sell up my, on, a, on a postcard that I sell at my lectures and I gave one each to the kids as a present for coming up to help me, you know, and we have to encourage the children, you know, because they are the future, you know, in life. Uh, so we have to do it in magic. Uh, I've no time for cliques, you know, where one group hangs out with one group and another group hangs out with another, regardless of their age, their sex, their creed or whatever in life, you know, never mind just magic. 
I'm not sure why you, you've seen this. I've not really noticed it much in, in conventions because usually I'm, I'm working at conventions like Blackpool. Oh, I'm, I'm behind my booth. And I don't get to see all that. And uh, I'm so tired at the end of the day. I go back to my hotel. I have a shower at Blackpool, meet a couple of friends for a beer and a meal. And then I'm in bed by 11 because I have to get up and do 10 hours on the dealer's floor the next day. You yeah. Know? yeah. So I don't notice those kind of things, you know. But bring everybody in, regardless of their age. Encourage the children, you know, and uh, you know, and uh, just try to help people of all ages, really, you know. Just and and just speak and be to be kind to people and speak to people the way you would like people to speak to you, you know. That's what carries me in life, you know. True, true. Well said. So I'm Thank going you. right here through my uh, through my notes a little bit, and. Uh, I will. I'm enjoying this. This is so much fun. <laughs> so happy. <laughs> so happy you said that. Uh, so uh, while we're still at the magic uh, community right now, can, can you name uh, off the top of your head like the first mentor that you had? Yes, Kevin Ray. Kevin Ray. Okay. If is he still Kevin alive? Ray. R e a y. No, sir. Unfortunately, Kevin. Uh passed away about nearly 20 years ago now. Uh, let's just say life got the better of him uh, personally and emotionally and financially. And uh, Kevin decided he could no longer continue, if, if you know what I mean. And, uh, I see. I'm sorry to hear uh, about that. Rest he sadly passed Kevin. away. I met Kevin at that convention in 1986. I saw him do the international close-up magic with uh, Aldo Colombini, another another great uh, magic star who's sadly no longer with us. And I loved Aldo and his work, still do. And uh, I saw Kevin perform, uh, I didn't know, I was only like 16 at the time. I saw Kevin perform what I later found out was called Matrix by Al Schneider, the original yeah, version. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I saw Kevin perform what I later found out was Di Vernon's Triumph, face up, face down, the tabled version. And he finished, um, and he finished with uh, his presentation for the Vernon Cups and Balls, and it was incredible. And uh, the next after after the show, I went over to him and said, "I just want to say how wonderful that was. My name's John, and he had a lovely smile, handsome guy. I shook his hand. I said, I want to learn this kind of magic. I'm just buying little tricks. So he said, meet me tomorrow for a coffee, and I'll take you to a dealer who sells books. Next day we meet for a coffee, and we go to this dealer, Magic Books by Post, very famous company many years ago in the UK. And uh, he asked the owner, one of the, one of the owners, the husband and wife, Donald and Betty, to pass over uh, an orange colored hardback book. And it was uh, The Royal Road to Card Magic by Jean Hugard and Frederick Browie. And it changed my life. And then me and Kevin used to meet regularly, kept in touch, no internet then. And he would teach me, he would get me to learn sh the overhand shuffle section, chapter one, and work through it. We would meet up again a couple of weeks later and I would show him my work. He would offer improvements and tips. And then he said to me, never jump the chapters though, until you are happy and I'm happy with chapter one, don't go to chapter two and so on, chapter three, four and five. And Kevin was great. He was uh, the first British magician to ever be booked on uh, the Paul Daniels magic show in the UK. This wow. was before, all the... yeah, this was the first, um, this was when the BBC, we only had four channels in the UK three at the time and then four when Channel 4 came along before cable and satellite come along biz and uh, Paul Daniel's show on prime time on Saturday night used to get 19, 20 million viewers, you know, in the UK and, Amazing. You know, and then, and he performed a wonderful routine call to the colors, uh, a Martin Nash version of a Bill Simon trick uh, where he used to ask for, what do you want me to do? Or reds or blacks? Do you want me to deal them in pairs, triples or singles? And, and then at the end, the full deck separation, you know, and he was great, Kevin. He was like a brother from another mother. And uh, we got to travel. We got to do some professional engagements together. He got me some he got me some bookings as well with the London agencies. And uh, he could do most of the slides ambidextrously. He could do second deals and bottom deals, wow. left hand to right hand, right hand to left, bottom palm, left hand, bottom palm, right hand, top palm, right hand, top palm, left hand. Incredible guy. Yeah. Kevin Ray. So you told me that, why did I ask you this? You told me that you have your own students right now, right? Yeah, online, online students uh, via Zoom and also in-person oh, students. Online yeah, students. 
and also people in person who either come to my home or we meet at a local cafe or a pub. Yeah. So have tell a beer me a little bit about how you decide how to teach somebody magic. How do you structure your lessons? How yeah, you well, the, the first thing I do is have a 20 minute Zoom conversation with them and discuss what have they been doing with their magic? How, how long have they been into magic? I want to know their experience. I want to know whether they've been in magic just six months, six years or 20 years. I want to know what they have studied book wise or maybe videos wise, DVDs, downloads. I sometimes get people come to me and I prefer it actually, who have only been in magic maybe five minutes, relatively speaking, you know, maybe just a, a few months or one or two years. Yeah. I tell you why Biz, because it's it's easier to teach somebody who don't ha doesn't have bad habits. If you get somebody who's been doing card tricks for 20 years and they've got lots of bad habits, they've maybe thought they've learned properly or been shown or watched, you have to unbreak those bad, uh, unbreak those bad habits, you know? Yeah. Um, so I need to know a little about, a bit about their background. I need to know what kind of person they are. And I get people come to me sometimes just for moves. They want controls and forces and moves. That's great. I get other people who want a repertoire. That's even more fun. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, but they want a repertoire. And I always I give them the advice. Uh, a very young student that's just interested in magic and would like to get into card magic. Yeah, I take younger students on sometimes, 15, 16, I think is the youngest, and, you know, try to give so them a you, foundation. How do you structure, like, the next few six, seven, ten lessons? What do you decide to teach them? Because they, maybe they want to just perform, so how well, do you if it's moves, it? If it's moves, firstly, I will give them, if they just want to learn moves, that's fine. Uh, but I encourage them, I give them a few applications of the moves, you know, as well, routines. Uh, semi-automatic, maybe basic slides, whatever. Uh, but I, um, with the moves, I structure where we talk about car control and they're not very experienced. I tell them why I don't like the double undercut for the reasons we discussed earlier. Um, the double undercut is good to shift shift positions of cards, I think, Biz, from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top, two or three yeah, cards. So good, so good for yeah. that. But not for a control, in my opinion. But that's just my opinion. Um, and I, I structure it, you know, so that they learn the moves. Uh, they learn different controls. I'll maybe give them five or six different controls. Some more difficult than others. But each has a reason or a purpose. The active controls with the shuffles and cuts. The passive controls. You know, like a side steal to the top. Or one of the passes, the Tommy Tucker. Or the, the Thompson pass I showed you earlier and other things. And then, and then I'll, I'll show them forces, then we'll move on to switches, you know, and I'll sh usually structure a lesson where there's about five or six of each thing. They get the, every student gets a recording, a Zoom cloud recording from me the same day. Uh, and then, and then, um, but sometimes uh, the student wants the lesson, the next lesson too quickly. Uh, because for me, it's not about the money. Uh, I say, okay, I see you again in maybe three to four weeks. Oh, you can't see me next week? I said, I can. But you've got new you've got new tools to learn. You've got to work on these things. Please send me private video, yeah. make a video and send me things. I can look in the meantime at the recording of you doing the the ABC move or the one two three uh, switch. But give it maybe three weeks or four weeks, yeah, and then we will book another lesson in for you. I could just book some people, and I could have done it before, one every week. But it's too much information too soon for the student. It's the same with routines. <clears throat> I usually teach free tricks uh, for just routines for repertoire. Maybe a production of the Aces, uh, a version of Twisting the Aces, and maybe a version of the last trick of Dr. Daly, the Aces transposition, you know. Um, but I don't, I, I, I don't want to do a lesson with them the next week and teach them three more tricks. What I want to do is see how they perform those effects. We've, most of us have got the means to make a movie, make a recording, get somebody to film it on their iPhone or film it with a laptop or a device in front of them, a tablet. And then I will look at it. And this way I can make some replies via um, uh, via uh, email, uh, maybe make a little clip and say, uh, Jason, that was great, but don't forget when you hold the card, you must blah, 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 you know, or, or so on. 
And then when we meet for the next session, I get them to perform each of the free tricks for me. And I mean really perform, not walk through the tricks. Like, I hate seeing magicians perform tricks and say, oh, have you seen this trick? Uh, I don't really do it, but this is what happens. And you, you know, present the effect. Present the effect as if this is an opportunity for you to meet the royal family. You know, every moment counts when you present effect. Yeah, every yeah. moment counts, you know, and... Um, you know, I saw a guy recently uh, interviewed by Sky on uh, British TV uh, before the Edinburgh Festival started, which is up in Scotland, Edinburgh, a month-long festival of, of magic and performance art. And this guy got given three minutes to talk and about what he was doing, performing magic, and he got, he got three minutes in which to perform one routine. Unfortunately, the routine he did, he wasn't very well prepared. He was nervous as well, nine TV cameras were on him. If that would have been me, I would have done something bulletproof, you know, that strong, yeah, you know? Of course. Yeah. Because how often do we get three minutes on national television, on Sky News, you know? Yeah, you're right. You're but right. he was a nice guy, and hopefully he learns from the experience. But um, and he, I hope he does well at Edinburgh. Um, so yeah, while we're so on like, this subject, I think this is the perfect moment to perform something and teach people right here at the interview thank you very much the the second effect i will be teaching today as well so the first effect though just a little performance just to break it up um uh, i hope you guys are, are having fun watching this biz is doing a great job for the magic community for big blind media and magic around the world you know and uh, he's got some exciting projects ahead that we did just discussed uh, when we went for a little break off camera um so first i'm going to show you something now with uh a little brass box here yeah? and inside I have one of these it's a, a rare Ming Dynasty Chinese coin and I'm going to put that coin into the box a lot of magicians bears snap their fingers say abracadabra and try to make the coin vanish but for me that's futile I like to reach out in the air grab a speck of dust toss that speck of dust oh that sounds good and from one coin we now get two coins here yeah? so that's one two Chinese coins from a little brass box yeah but there's more the fun has just begun because one goes in the box, two goes in the box. Clearly, yeah? Just two coins. We close up the box, we grab a speck of dust here, a speck of dust there, and from two, we now get one, two, three, and four silver coins. But there's more. The fun has just begun because this trick's called two and two. That's two, and that's two there. A little squeeze, and now we have three on the table. Cover those with my hand. That goes there, and over here is one, two, three, and four coins. One of these coins will be the leader. I think that one's a good one. That goes in the box. The lid clearly goes on the box, yeah? So, Mr. Biz, we have three Chinese coins, a coin in the box. But watch, just a tap and a shake, and now there's only two coins there. That sounds good. And now in the box is two coins. That's one, two coins in the box. Watch this next coin, Mr. Bears. It's like a piece of chocolate. It just whoo, melts away at my fingertips. And over here now in the box, we have one, two, three little coins. So three coins in the box, right, Biz? Yeah. How many coins? Three. Just three, yeah. Just yep. three. And uh, we'll leave that coin there. So what I'm going to attempt to do now, I'll put this coin in the hand. I've got to attempt to send it over to the box. Actually, I can't do that. I'll do something better. Listen, no coins. That's because oh, the coins are over here. That. <laughs> look at that. Thank you very much. There you go. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, I love the Akito box. Uh, I don't talk about a, a, a little antique box or a pill box. I say a little brass box and some coins and do the magic. Anybody, people can find this anywhere and learn it? Uh, no, um, at the moment I'm published. Uh, just thought I would share a performance with you and our friends today. <laughs> nice, there we go. So watch out for that, guys. All coin lovers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, shall we perform the new effect and uh, and teach it for the guys now? Yeah. Yes. Let's see. Okay, I've got three predictions here. Three blueback cards. We'll leave those just here. I'm gonna try and look into the future. And, uh, and my trusty deck of cards. And you're going to uh, make some choices in a moment, Biz. 
Okay. Ever since I was a child, I've been fascinated uh, by uh, spaceships, rockets, and things like that. I used to remember watching on the TV uh, the NASA rocket ships as a kid at Cape Canaveral, USA, launching off, but they always used to do a countdown uh, from 10, 10, 9, 8, 7, six. we have liftoff. So with that in mind, it inspired what you're about to see, because you're going to make three different choices, yeah? Uh, so what we're going to do is really, really simple. I'm going to deal and count down from 10 to 1, but you're going to stop me somewhere between 10 and 1, because this okay. is like a game, but also not just a game, we will have a ritual as well. So we will play a game, but we will also have a ritual with numbers. Uh, do you understand? Interesting. Let's see. Okay, so I count down from 10 to 1, but you must stop me somewhere, yeah? In between, yeah? Yeah. Ready? Yeah. 10, 9, stop. 8, 7. You stopped on 7. Are you yes. happy with that? I am. As this, is a, as this is a ritual, I must deal 7 cards. You stopped on number 7. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and I will put that 7th card with my first prediction. Okay? Okay. We give the card uh, a little shuffle. And we do the ritual again, yeah? I will count down from 10. Maybe you want to stop at a different number this time. It's entirely up to you. 10, yep. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. You stopped on 4. You're happy yep. with that? I am. As you stopped on number 4, and this is a ritual, we must steal 4 cards. That's 1, 2, 3. And we put that one with there. Obviously, a different number would have been a different card, right? Okay. Sure. One prediction to go. Uh, once again, I will count down from 10. Are you ready? I am. That was just a joke. <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Stop. 4, 3. Oh, you stopped on 3 this time. But you could have stopped yeah. on 6 or 9. Anything is possible. But, but because this is a ritual, the rocket count ritual, we must deal 1, 2, 3 cards. And that's the third card. Goes with my third prediction. So think about this. From a shuffle deck, you've made 3 separate decisions just counting down from 10 to 1. Different numbers would have arrived on different cards. My first prediction was the three of clubs. The card you stopped at was the three of clubs. My that. second prediction was the queen of hearts. You stopped on the queen of hearts. Now that could just be luck. That could just be a coincidence. That is my final prediction. So if that's luck and that's coincidence, this must be magic, ridiculous. <laughs> but I know what you're thinking. I was doing this the other day and somebody said, well, what do you do with the rest of the cards, John? I said, not very much. He said, no, stop joking. I said, I don't do anything. He said, no, you're joking. I said, can you keep a secret? And they say, yeah. I say, look, I am joking. In fact, I'm a big joker because you see, this whole pack is nothing but joker, 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 joker. I guess the joke's on me, Biz. There we go. Thank you so much. Wow, so clever. I like it. I like it. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, shall we teach it to the guys now? Yeah, let's go for it. All right then. So, uh, this is like a triple coincidence, supercharged trick, which is a lot of fun to do. And here we do, here we are as the details. Yeah, I'm gonna so what we need cards as well. Oh, well, oh. Uh, I'm preparing the the trick as well. Well, so all oh, right, there. great. So, do you want to use the same cards as me? Do you have a one way deck as well? Uh, no, I'm just gonna do it without the. The, the Joker finale. All right, yeah. So it was three of clubs, queen of spades, nine of clubs? Uh, not quite, sir, no. Uh, three of clubs. Yes. Queen of hearts. Queen of hearts. And nine of spades. There we go. Nine of spades, yeah, you need a bit of diversity. There we go, got it. Right, so from the top down, they are from the top down biz, three of clubs, and underneath the queen of hearts. Underneath that, the nine of spades. There we go. Three of clubs and... Because I, I need it from two different decks and queen of hearts. So these are my predictions. Yeah, and the order is important for this explanation. Three of clubs, underneath queen of hearts, underneath nine of spades. Yes, got that. 
So that packet could be in your pocket or a wallet or whatever, yeah? We okay. just leave it to one side. I use a one-way deck of jokers. You can get these from any magic shop. Pickblindmedia.com. You're welcome, Owen. Thank you. No problem. Um, <laughs> or any magic shop. So this is a one-way deck of jokers. Also, you need three false cards, and these match the predictions perfectly. Three of clubs, queen of hearts, and nine of spades, yeah? Yep. Okay. What we're going to do is set the deck up for something called the Countback Force, which uh, was or originated by uh, a gentleman from America called, Ter called Terry LaGerald. Terry LaGerald. Wow. Uh, L-A-G-E-R-A-U-L-D. And I believe he first published this in Harry Lorraine's Apocalypse magazine, the, the concept, okay? Yep. What I need to do is put the, the free cards in this order, free, nine and queen, at positions 11, 12, and 13, 11, 12, and 13 from the top. So one, two, a deal jokers, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There we go. I'm here, I'm here, I just got to charge the laptop. There. No problem, Biz. So I deal ten face up jokers to prepare before performance, and then I place the three of clubs at number 11, the queen of hearts at number 12, and the nine of spades at number 13. Got it. Tell me when you're ready. Ready. Flip the deck over. So now the three, the nine, and the queen are 11, 12, and 13 from the top of the deck. Okay? Yep. I bring out my three predictions and I deal them into a left to right row without the people seeing. And obviously the three of clubs will go to my left, queen of hearts will go to the middle, and the nine of spades will go to the right, yeah? Three, nine, and queen from your left to right. Yeah. It's, I think it's important to give the deck some kind of full card or full shuffle. I did the optical shuffle here, where you're undercutting about half the deck and you're apparently peeling off, shuffling off, but really you're scraping the edge against this packet like this. It's a bluff. You're not taking anything. And then I keep a big break and, and throw back on top. So scrape nothing off like this, big separation throw on top yep. okay if you want to though just a simple JOZ cup cutting a packet to your left the middle and the right is okay something like that or our, or our dear friend John Bannon has a great uh, a great false cut in one of his books where you you cut off packets like this four packets and and you and you do this which is really really cool really nice, nice. and John full deck false cut no, bitch. No, no, no. I don't think that's going to work for you. You, you missed something out there. Uh, what you're doing is cutting off a small packet of about 10 cards. Yeah. Then you're cutting off a bigger packet of about 15 cards, putting them to the right, and then lifting off some of that second packet and putting it ah. to the right. Ah, and yes. Then you, the last, then you put the last packet to the right. And now what you do, imagine from your left to right, you guys watching at home, the, the packet on my left is packet one, packet two, three, and four. I pick up packet one, I hopscotch over onto packet three, then I pick up packet two, I hopscotch over onto packet four, then I pick up this leftmost packet and that goes back on top. That is a full deck control. The uh, the three, queen, and nine. They're still there. Are still 11, 12, and 13. Yep. Okay. So that's the Bannon cut, which is great. So some full shuffle and or full cut. Now we do the count back force. But if if I just said I'm going to count and deal from 10 to 1, it feels too mathematical. So I put a story around it, a, a simple story. How since I since I've been a child, I was a child, I was always fascinated with watching on the TV and in the movies the rocket launches from Cape Canaveral by NASA, and they used to count down the rocket ship before the launch: 10, 9, 8, 7. We have liftoff. So that's my introduction to kind it's of try to rationalize beautiful, this procedure. Beautiful presentation. Okay. So basically, we just go through this now. And we, we can go through this together. You can go through it, yeah. What I'm doing is now, I say I'm going to count down from 10 to 1, but you must stop somewhere in between. And that instruction is important. I'm going to count and deal down from 10 to 1, but you must stop somewhere in between. Because this is a game with numbers. But also, as well as this game, we will make a ritual. And that covers the second part of the process, the force. So we're going to make a game, and then we're going to have a ritual. 
So I start the countdown. 10, 9, 8. Let's just say they stop on 7. Yeah. I say you stopped on 7. But you could have stopped on any number. Because this is a ritual, I have to deal 7 cards. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. When you get to the 7th card, this will automatically be your 3 of clubs. Yeah. And I place that on the prediction on the left. Important now, pick up the packet you've dealt on the table and drop it on top. It's now important to do a full shuffle or a full cut now. Uh, I did the lift shuffle from the Royal Road to Card Magic. Undercut about three quarters of the deck. Take that packet in my left hand, the small packet. Steal that packet behind this packet and just shuffle off to the separation. Like that. Yeah. The lift shuffle, yes? Yeah? So once again. And then throw these on top. Okay? I think everything is good. Let me just make sure for the guys. Nope, I messed it up there because I, I think I did it twice. But you should do the left shuffle. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we get the, the queen eleven and the nine twelve. You don't have to do the left shuffle. You can just do maybe. Uh, my dear friend, the late Bobby Bernard, had a lovely false cut where you swing cut, tap twice, and do that. That's enough. Yep. That's enough. Or the J.O.Z. cut, or whatever. Then we do the countdown again. Are you ready? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Let's say they stop on 5. Yeah. You say, because you stopped on 5, that means because it's a ritual, we have to deal 5 cards. Deal 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The fifth card goes on your middle prediction yeah pick up the packet from the table execute one more false cut you could do any false cut you want a simple joz cut left the right packets keep it simple but keep it strong yeah and then the last time i do a gag first are you ready from 10 to 1 that was a joke just to add a bit of fun for entertainment mm -hmm. and let's say this time let's tell you let's say this time they stop on two yeah 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Oh, we nearly ran out of cards. You could have stopped anywhere, but you stopped on two. Because this is a ritual, we have to deal one, two cards. And I take the second card. That will be the nine of spades. That goes on there. The deck goes on top. Methodologically, Biz, the trick is done. You build up what has happened. That They could have stopped anywhere. And you show your prediction, and you show a perfect match. You show your prediction, and you show a perfect match. You show your prediction, and you show a perfect match. And then let that effect sink in. Because they're not going to see this finish coming. Never. Nobody's going to see this finish coming. Then I gather these up so I've got a clear table space for the ribbon spread. And I said, I was doing this the other day, and somebody said, well, what do you do with the rest of the cards? And I say, nothing. They say, no, you're joking. I say, yeah, actually, I am joking. Can you keep a secret? I turn the pack over and show the joker. And I say, actually, I'm a big joker. And I rip and spread face up and then start smearing the cards as I say, joker, 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 with lots of energy. Yeah, lots of energy. I guess the joke is on me. And that's the applause gear. And that, and that is the uh, that is the triple prediction effect. And I sincerely hope you guys at home uh, watching business videos uh, and this interview today enjoy it. Get out there and have some fun with it. This is a beautiful force for anybody that doesn't know this force. I, I didn't know it before you did it. I think you can use it in so many other tricks. So oh, no, I definitely. think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to teach people. Thank you very much for that, John. So no, much. my pleasure. I, I think the rocket. I think the rocket presentation, counting down. That gives it something, you know, and the ritual, yes. and the ritual. We're going to play a game with numbers and a ritual, and this justifies. So yeah. It justifies what otherwise would be uh, a mathematical looking kind of smelling thing, you know? Yeah, exactly. I talked with, um, with uh, one of my friends the other, like a, a while ago, and he talked about how spectators will think while you tell them to think, you know? But if you don't tell them anything, you are allowing them to think only about the method, because that's what any normal person will do. They're just, how is he doing this? Is he doing something fishy now? So when you have a presentation like this and it's 
it involves them into a magical world or it tells a story, they don't have time to think about anything else but what you're telling them. Absolutely. And also, it's, I'm, I'm not naturally a comedian, you know, a, a comedy guy. But as Danny Dortes always says, if you can have in a moment or more, one moment or maybe two or three moments, but at least one moment in effect, which will make the spectator laugh a little bit or smile or show some emotion, that's great because while they are reacting by laughing, they cannot be thinking about something else at the same time because you cannot process two pieces of information at the same time. You know, this is what they call the pensada in Spanish, you know, the brain, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Pensada. So before we end this uh, beautiful interview, I would like to talk about one of the one of the things that creators always have to deal with and they have to overcome and that is being stuck having a mental a creative block and you've been creating for more than 15 years now and yes, you sir. must have been in a moment when you were like what what do i do so what did you do how do you get out of a creative uh, block uh, I switched off from magic and this happened to me a couple of years ago. I, I had one year, I had one year because I've been publishing books now for nearly 10 years, one every year. But two years ago, uh, I hit a block, I hit a wall and I, I was in danger of burning out, I think, you know, and uh, so, I decide, so I decided just to basically to switch off from, from writing. I had a project I'd started and I just left it on the back burner. And I went and did some traveling. I love to travel overseas. I'm lucky I've got friends around the world I've made through my magic. And um, basically, I kind of went off the grid. I, w I went away for about seven or eight weeks over to the Canary Islands in Spain. And I, I just I just chilled out and had a holiday. And I was just a tourist for nearly two months. Yeah, I kept an eye on my Facebook and my socials. And I had I had two packs of cards in my case because I go crazy if I, if I can't just hold the cards, you know. And... But I wasn't putting sure. myself under pressure. I wasn't putting myself under pressure to write or create biz, you know. And this done me the world of good because when I come back, it gave me a new energy, you know. Um, yes. It's important sometimes when you're like that, don't to, don't push it or force it, you know. Just relax, you know. You know, and put that project away for a while and do something, do something completely different. Go go to watch more movies. Go, you know, go out for more meals and drinks and free up your time and go do some traveling and, you know, and explore and, you know, and, and see beautiful places and, you know, go somewhere where you can just sit and have a lovely coffee right by the beach with the sun, with the sun and a, and a beautiful blue sky. And, uh, yeah, let me tell you, uh, the Canaries has got some of the most beautiful women in the world. It was like, wow, you know, I'm just there and I've got my cards and I'm cigarette outside. And I felt so chilled, you know, and, uh, Basically, if you get burnout or you, you get block, don't worry about it. Just have a rest. Don't overthink it. Just have a rest. Yeah, Beautiful. that's important. That's important. You have to give the mind a rest. Otherwise, <laughs> Yeah, otherwise you burn out for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I always, uh, at the end of every episode, I give it over to the interviewee and to be able to say anything, if you would like to say anything to anybody watching, if you'd like to talk about a future project, this is your moment to talk about anything you would like. Oh, thank you so much. That's very, very kind of you. Um, Magic for me has given me so many good opportunities, great opportunities. I mentioned earlier in Busy's interview, and I just want to go on record as saying I've done a few of these uh, over the last few years, and I think this is my favorite one so far. I've had some great fun with previous interviews online but this is this has been great this has been really really great um and hopefully i'll be seeing you soon uh, biz if, uh, if mr packard agrees to me coming over to romania to film download projects for big blind media let's uh, keep our fingers crossed on that um basically just have fun you know and uh, creatively speaking never rule anything in or out you know always ask yourself what if you know and explore and play you know it's all about creative play you know whether it's the cards whether it's the akito box the the coins a piece of mentalism with billets business cards or whatever um keep it fun you know and there are no rules you know and uh 
if you want to learn some flourishes as well biz is a great resource for that you know and learn some flourishes maybe you'll get into cardistry but you know uh, hopefully you won't leave magic um, basically uh, I'm lucky I I'm lucky uh, I'm a 55 year old guy who gets to play with something I love I get to travel with something I love I get to meet people based on a common love of magic you know and travel around the world um, I know what it's like to work hard in a, in a day job I did it for nearly 24 years many many years ago I mentioned earlier so I think that makes me that keeps me grounded I realize what it's like to get up bloody early in the morning and uh, and get go to work you know um, yeah. as far as uh, projects go uh, uh, yes I'm uh, way ahead on next year's book project uh, which will be a follow-up to John Kerry and Friends, my recent release, available only from me. Uh, I did give Owen a box to sell, just as a favour to Owen a while ago, and he very kindly uh, purchased a case from me, but they're now sold out, so you can only get that from me. Uh, yeah. The work on... Vol the, thank you. The work on, on Volume 2 is well underway. In fact, uh, it's going to be a monster. Uh, volume 1 was 256 pages. But as we stand at the moment, Volume 2, a collaboration between me and some very talented creators from around the world. Uh, and I'd love to have you on board, Biz. I haven't approached you yet. If you've got a trick or tricks you want to uh, you want to write up and share, it would be an absolute honour to uh, have a couple of well, Biz. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, we're now up to 418 pages. Uh, wow! Um, yeah, so it's going to be a monster. Um I actually got a sample of when it was 310 pages done a few weeks ago. I actually got a sample, but my printer printed. That's the artwork for next year's book. This is just a sample, uh, yeah, and that's yeah. 310. That's 310 pages, and that's the artwork. Uh, beautiful artwork, and uh, yes, that's a tease. That will be coming out in February, February next year. Uh, I may launch it at Blackpool, but I'm not sure yet. Uh, but it would definitely be an online launch with a special pre-order. Uh, promotion uh, where people will get some free swag some free stuff as well and a discounted price uh, during the month of the pre-order um, what else do I want to say um, not, not really just that I think I've covered every base I've had such a great time today with you Biz big shout out to Biz Steve. for the work he does uh, Owen, whatever, Owen Packard whatever you're paying him it's not enough the guy deserves a raise and uh, Oh, thanks a million to you, Biz. Thanks a million to Owen and Peter and Alakazam, and uh, and 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 the magic, uh, the magic community, the companies, Penguin and Murphy's in the USA, and everybody who supported me. You know, you give me a chance to to do something I love, and you can't put a price on that. And I'm looking. I actually hate watching me on interviews, but I'm actually looking forward uh, to watching this interview when you get it back to me, the recording, because uh, I've had so much fun, man. And thanks ever so much, Biz, for having me. And thank you guys for watching. Thank you for that. That was John Kerry. An amazing episode. Thank you guys very much for tuning until now. We're going to have more episodes with more people. And be sure to check them out. Turn the notification button. Let us know what did you think about the interview. What was, favorite, what was your favorite part? If you have any thoughts about the things that we discussed, drop a comment down. My name is Biz. We're Big Blind Media. And we love you. Thank you for being with us. And thank you, John Kerry, once more for being with us today. An absolute pleasure, Biz. Bye, Biz. Enjoy your day. Bye, guys. Take care and have fun.